John chapter 14, beginning in verse 19. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for our family here. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you that you're always working, Lord, and we yield to you, Jesus, as the head of the church this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would accomplish your great purpose that you have for each one of us. Thank you that you bring so powerfully uh, and you come across with clear instruction and application for us. Lord, we want, don't want to be self-deceptive and engage in, 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 um, ideas that are not according to your word. Lord, we want to obey your word and not just hear it alone. Lord Jesus, you said um, that if we obey, hear your word and obey it, we're like a man who builds his house upon a rock. Um, And when the, the storms, wind and the storms come, Lord, that house will stand. So we want our houses to stand by obeying what your word says to us. And we thank you for your great heart as we see it clearly displayed in these verses this morning, we love you for it. And we love you that you have thought of everything we, and you want to be so close to us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus is still pouring into his disciples. Uh, later on this evening, he's going to be arrested. And there's the chain of events that start that um, culminate in his death on the cross that was predicted in the Old Testament, that fulfilled the Old Testament system of sacrifices, and and where Jesus on the cross took the wrath that we deserved, and it was the full and satisfying payment for the forgiveness of our sins. We, we, We don't deserve heaven. We get it as a free gift because of his death. And so God was just and the justifier all the same time at the cross. Jesus knows that's coming. Jesus knows that it's going to hit the disciples with all the force that you that could be possible. And they're going to be scattered. That was prophesied too. He's already told them that, that they're going to all scatter. And um, we, we've seen that Jesus has shown so much love and concern by speaking into the disciples' lives at such a strategic time. His last public miracle was the uh, raising of Lazarus from the dead. That's finished now. Now he's alone with them. He's pouring into them because he cares about them. And, and he's been talking about, and we saw it last week, that he promised the Holy Spirit for them. And we saw him talk about another counselor, another of the same kind is coming. And just like he came alongside to help them, the Holy Spirit's going to come alongside to help them. And, and he says, he's going to say, and we'll see it in, um, throughout this passage, but he, you know, he's basically saying, it's your advantage that I go away. Uh, and, and so he's not, I'm not going to leave you orphans. In fact, let's read uh, back in verse 16, uh, verse through 18 he, again. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So we looked at last week, the biblical basis for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we looked at three different prepositions. We looked at how he's with us before we're believers, convicting us of sin, speaking of judgment, compelling us to follow Jesus. That's the Spirit's work. So when we're preaching the gospel, we are partnering with the Holy Spirit. 
He's doing the work. We're not the Holy Spirit. We just share the gospel, and he does the work. That's very important as you share your faith, because we can't be held responsible for convicting the world of sin. We can't be held responsible of drawing them to him. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. So we have to know our place. So that's what he does before we're believers. Then when we receive Christ, he comes inside of us and he indwells us. And, and then later, most of the time later, but sometimes it happens at salvation, uh, we have this upon experience where we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. I gave you four examples from scripture where someone was or a group was baptized with the Holy Spirit subsequent to salvation. Gave you four different biblical examples. And then we saw that it's incumbent upon us, and where Paul the Apostle in, in Ephesians clearly says to not be, get, don't be drunk with wine as is dissipation, but be being filled or be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we're leaky vessels. We leak. And we need power to be witnesses to Jesus. Again, Jesus educated the disciples. He gave them ministry experience. But he says, wait, 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 wait. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything. Wait till the promise of the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2 for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They were indwelt in, in John chapter 20 after he rose from the dead. So we saw that. And then so today, as we look at some of the things Jesus reveals after that, and isn't it great that we have all these words that John the Apostle, the, these, this whole section obviously was not in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, wasn't in there. And this had been for 30 years, it hadn't been in there. I'm not saying they didn't know about it, it wasn't passed on by word of mouth, they could have had other writings and all those things. I'm not ignoring that. But not formally did, a, did one of the apostles write something that recorded what happened. And I don't know if the Holy Spirit moved on John's heart and said, they need to know this. This needs to be known what Jesus said to his disciples the night of his betrayal. But today we're going to look at God's desire and promise to be as intimate with us as he possibly could be. Couldn't be any, you can't make a case after studying this, these verses that, there's, that God could be any closer than what he is with us as we uh, come to know him and as we obey him. One of the most surprising things uh, before we come to know the Lord, well, before we come to know the Lord, we don't really think about God wanting to be um, intimate with us. We're trying to, most of the time, we're trying to avoid conversations about God. We have our own thoughts that we're thinking about God, that we elevate above God's word because we don't know God's word yet. And so it's incumbent upon us to submit as we learn his word and we start growing to submit our ideas to his word. And one of those things that we would never guess is that God would want to be that intimate with us. Well, you know, so before you come to know the Lord, you're just thinking, you know, I just, you know, whatever we believe about God, you know, I'm good with him. He's the man upstairs or whatever. And I just heard a podcast this week where an unbeliever said, um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with whatever religion anybody is. And I'm good with that. I'm at peace with that. And he claims to be a Christian. And that's a misunderstanding of Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the father, but by me, Jesus said that. So I don't want to elevate my thinking above what God's word says. I want to submit my thinking to what God's word said. Jesus could have made many different ways to heaven. And people believe that. It's called pluralism. All roads lead to heaven. But Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you're not going to get to the Father except by me. Because what's the requirement for heaven? Righteousness. And the problem is we don't have any that God accepts. He says our righteousness, he led Isaiah to say our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's our best performance. To say nothing of our sin, that's our best religious moral performance is filthy rags to God. And those were leprosy rags, menstrual rags, like take your pick. Uh, horrible rags that, you, that, that is, it, it, we're asking God to accept. So, uh, you know, 
I love the fact that Jesus is, is saying, I want to be intimate with you. I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. And he wants that intimacy. So the title of my message this morning is the father and son make their home in us. Notice in verse 19 that he begins promising the resurrection life to the disciples. Look with me in verse 19. He says, a little while longer and the world will see me no no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Once Jesus is put in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, he's a rich man, part of the Sanhedrin, He's the one that prepared Jesus' body with, with Nicodemus, and the women brought all the, the, the spices and all of that. They prepared his body. They put him in his tomb, his personal family tomb. He was wealthy. You don't just have a tomb waiting during that time. It wasn't normal. But he, once he was in that tomb, the world didn't see him again. For, but for 40 days, subsequent to his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples Uh, Paul, the apostle, wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, that Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren all at once. And when Paul wrote that, he said, and the majority of them are still alive. In other words, go talk to them. Eyewitness testimony uh, of the resurrection. But we're not told that he ever appeared to any unbelievers subsequent to his resurrection. Those disciples witnessed Jesus risen. I know this isn't Easter yet, um, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. They saw him, and that's powerful evidence because what did they get in return for their persecution and their death? They went to their death saying, I saw him raised from the dead. What you're not going to do if you don't get anything in return, you don't, it's just like I've seen him, and I've seen uh, his risen life. And so he's... He, you know, he's pouring into them and he's promising this that he says, and look at the end of the verse, because I live, you will live also. So he directly connects their future resurrected life with his resurrection. What a beautiful promise to them that he says, because I live, because it's kind, you, you don't, you won't understand this, but because I live, you will live also, what an incredible promise that we can bank on. He refers to us as falling asleep, and he has taken the sting out of death. He's taken the sting out of death. And so we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We have hope in Jesus. And it's not blind faith. It's faith based on fact. It's faith, faith, faith based on evidence. But notice in verse 20, he begins to speak of this intimacy, which he desires for us. Look at me at verse 20. He says, at that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. So what is he talking about in verse 20? In that day, what day? The day that of his resurrection. Jesus is saying, not only is there good reasons why he's going away, but when he demonstrates his victory over death, they will better understand how interconnected they were with the Father and Jesus. Very important to see related to this passage. And I want you to know in verse 20 that the word know there is a very specific Greek word. It's our old friend, gnosko. Okay, it means knowledge by experience. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth by experience and the truth shall set you free. So he says, you will know by experience that I am in the Father, and, and you in me, and I in you. So what were they going to experience on, on the resurrection, on Resurrection Sunday? What were they going to experience? Well, we went over it last week in John chapter 20, which we'll get to in six chapters. In the evening, he appeared to them all in the room, and he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and, and that's how Jesus could be in them And that's how Jesus can be in us, is by the Holy Spirit. And so we receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. And and so God has made this incredible way for us to experience that intimacy because he comes and lives inside of us. Incredible to think that he could live inside of us. Can I just say that we often take that for granted? That we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit? 
that we're walking around with God literally inside of us. Now, this isn't the New Age version of God's inside of us, because that's talking about just a natural, you know, we're, God, you know, we're divine inside. We're not talking about that. But the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, and he makes our dead spirits alive. They're inoperable before we come to know Christ. We don't have a relationship with God in the sense of knowing him and having it's called regeneration. When he comes into our lives and he makes our dead spirits alive, Jesus didn't come to make good people better. He came to make dead people alive. He came to, to come inside, forgive us of our sins, give us his Holy Spirit, and now we are regenerated. Now he comes and lives inside of us. And I think that we forget that sometimes. And I think that we real, that there's implications for that. Because we, we, sometimes we go, oh, I just want to feel closer to God. How much closer? And I get that. But how much closer can he be? He lives inside of us. He's living inside of us. He can't be any closer. So now Jesus is going to talk about um, obedience as the main way we show him love. So let's talk about first, though, what love is. Because in our culture, we need to keep bringing up, you know, kind of what we deal with. If we're talking about being salt and light in this world, this culture defines love differently than how the Bible defines it. This culture defines love as something physical. It describes, or it describes love as a feeling, you know. And so all of a sudden, you know, one day we, we, have, we have love, one day it's, it's gone. I don't know where it went, you know, where'd it go? It's not biblical, the world defines love as a feeling. We confuse, listen, they confuse love for affection. They confuse love for affection. The main word in the New Testament for love is agape. Most of us know that, some of us don't. But it's a sacrificial, unconditional love. Jesus said men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and they don't want to come into the light lest their deeds be exposed. That's the word agape. That's, an un, that's a non-Christian or carnal version of agape love. We unconditionally love our sin. We unconditionally um, will sacrifice for our sin before we come to know Christ. But once we come to know Christ, we, under, we learn the godly agape, which is the, the almost every other version of, of the word agape in the New Testament. So what is agape? Agape is doing what's best for the other person, even at our own expense. I would say in this world, the, mo the closest we could come, even though there's another Greek word for family love, um, is a love that a mother has for her children. She'll do anything. And there's nothing stopping her from doing what's best for her child. And it's volitional. It's of my will. It's a willful thing. I'm choosing to do it. And we have control over it. It's not elusive. It's something that's really, really under my control. You know, to say that I'm going to love you. It means I'm going to sacrifice for you. I'm going to do what's best for you, even if it's as a sacrifice for me. You know, if I was wanting to be your friend and I said, you know, I love you and I, I'm saying all these words, but my actions are to the contrary of what is best for you, you're not going to believe what I'm saying with my mouth, right? It's the same way with the Lord in the sense of we show him our love and we show him that we care what he cares about. Loving God is action and it's, in, it's involved in showing him our, our love for him and loving his people. Obeying Jesus is loving Jesus. Obedience is Jesus' love language. He loves our obedience to him because he knows it's difficult for us. And he knows that that's not who we used to be, but we're demonstrating, and, and, you know, obedience to him has to be done with his power. I want to stress that. You can't love in your own strength in terms of obedience. You know, we can't obey in our own strength because we fall short. We can do a little bit around the edges, <laughs> but we can't fully obey him without help. That's why when we want to obey the Lord, when we're struggling to do that, we need to ask his help and ask for his strength. And when we stop in the moment, we recognize and say to God, I don't have in me what's required right now. And I don't want to obey you. And it's great to have January share about how she didn't want to 
obey what Jesus wanted her to do. But she obeyed anyway. Probably prayed and asked God for strength. And look how, how God used that. And I can't even tell you the examples that I've seen over the years in my own life and through in other people's lives of how God blesses our dependence upon Him in obeying what He says to do. So, now let's look at what he says in verse 21 related to this. He says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, is, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Well, first of all, we need to know that the word keeps there. Look in verse 21. He says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, the word keeps is a military term that they used. It would be used to describe someone guarding a post or guarding a position in, in the field or whatever. And it was a very serious thing that they were doing in militaries of, of, of guarding and keeping. So I believe what Jesus is speaking about being as diligent to obey his commandment as a military officer would be guarding his post. That's, that's an ex a massive amount of diligence. There's more and more flippancy in the church at large regarding the importance of obedience to Christ. Because the problem is, as I've mentioned before, there's so much focus on, in churches, me, in terms of prosperity and getting what I want um, with self-help type messages. And Jesus is saying, just obey what I say. It's not about you supremely. It's about me. And it's about you obeying what I've said to do. So that's how Jesus is shown love, is by obedience to his word. Obedience is still better than sacrifice. So we obey him, and none of us fully do that every day perfectly. We're all growing in that. But the goal should be, just because I can't be perfect in that, doesn't mean I keep going the right direction and learning how to ask for his help. That's the key. And he's going to get into that. We'll get into that in chapter 15. The, the, the key is having him bear fruit through our lives by us getting close to him. So Jesus is the only one that said, I always do those things which please the Father. So the solution, again, is getting close to him. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Have you ever been, before you sin, be completely under self-control? No. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, not in, you're not in that realm. You're not in that thinking. And, and, and he says, that's what I'll produce is you, if you trust in me and rely upon me, I will produce those things through your life. So he says, it is he who keeps my commandments. It is he who loves me. See, we, we want all the benefits, the world does anyway, all the benefits of you know, heaven and all these things, but yet they just, they just want to do what they want to do. And that isn't in line with what Jesus said. Now notice he says, And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. Manifest myself to him. Amazing. Look at this intimacy. Look, It's unbelievable. Look how close he wants to be with us. How does Jesus manifest himself to us? Because he doesn't say, it's very important for us to see what he's not saying here. He's not saying, merely that he's going to manifest his blessings to us, though that's true. And there's other scriptures to support that. He says, I will manifest myself. Now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. So he's not meaning physically coming to earth. And um, he warned against that in Matthew 24. He said, if anyone says, look, here he is, you know, in the inner rooms or whatever, don't believe him. The next time you're going to see him, me physically is when I come back. Uh, and the angel said that to the disciples when he ascended. And he said he's going to come back the same way he went up, visible for everybody to see. So he's talking about his Holy Spirit, that his Holy Spirit manifests Jesus to us. And, and, and he, provides, he provides all these amazing things to us, his peace, his presence. There's nothing like being in a room, being quiet before him, and sensing his presence in the room. There's nothing like that. You don't want to move. You just want to just in, enjoy that. Take it in. I don't know how you explain it. It's like we don't even know how to properly react to it. But it's amazing when he manifests himself 
and he manifests himself in our lives. He's, because we see him actively participating and in, in, in interacting with us as we follow him. You know, one of the things that young people um, love to talk about when they really realize it, that, that it's, this is all legitimate is that Jesus is real. Like they're shocked that they're telling us Jesus is real. Yes, he's real. He's alive. This is all true. And we focus on church, and that's great. Trust me, I'm a big believer in church. But it's, it's, it's what you, when you're sharing your faith with people, communicate to them that it's between them and the Lord directly, intimately, a relationship between them and God. That's what, that's what that temple curtain, when it was ripped from top to bottom, was communicating. That because of this death and the subsequent resurrection, you have access you have access to God directly. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One mediator. That means that a pastor is not a mediator. It means a church is not a mediator. It means there's all kinds of things that is not, is not a mediator. Popes, saints, whatever it is you want to say, there's no Mary. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He doesn't want anything in between us and him. He's, he's worked and died and all these things to be able to make that possible for us. So it's a beautiful thing that he, that he, that he does here, but obedience is what he says is how we show that we love God saying no to sin by the spirit saying yes. When he tells us to do something good by, by allowing him to direct our lives. Oh, you want me to go talk to that person at Chevron? You want me to talk to that person at Subway that's in line waiting for a, a foot long that he probably shouldn't be eating? I don't, maybe he's, he's supposed to eat that. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm, I've thought, why don't they have two foot longs? Some people would take advantage of that. Um, but here I go off my notes. Um, it's important to remember that we don't obey to get to heaven. We don't obey to get to heaven. We obey because we're already on our way to heaven. That's a difference. We're not saved by works. We're saved unto good works. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship or his poem created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance that we should walk in those things. So we, we have to understand that. But, but so since we're not saved by works, do we just forget works? Do we forget why he saved us? He saved us so we can bring him glory and demonstrate that by serving and being um, a blessing to people and loving people. So he gave us eternal life as a free gift. Once you understand that it's a free gift, then you stop working for it. At one point they said to Jesus, they said, what must we do to do the works of God? And he says, believe on him who he has sent. Belief. That's it. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can never do enough good works to undo our sin. That's why we have to trust in what Jesus did for us on the cross and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. That is the gospel. First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said that I pass on to you, which I first received, that he died according to the scriptures. Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again according to the scripture. That's the gospel. That's the good news that Jesus intervened in that way. So, the Christian life then is not to get heaven. It's a response to already have heaven. You know, when we receive Christ, we cross over from death to life. We cross over from death to life. We're a new creation in Christ. And so because of that, he calls us to live a different kind of life. He says, be holy for I am holy. All these things he is desiring for us to do and be a part of because that's how he is. That's who he is. And he wants us to be like him. Jesus said, my commandments are not burdensome. What did he say? He said, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. So it's very, very simple. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's very, very simple that we just love him and love everyone, love this way vertically, love everyone horizontally, and ask for his strength to do those things. And, and when we do that, then we will be demonstrating that we are thankful and we love him because that he's given us heaven as a free gift and that uh, he's using us in people's lives. So 
No teaching from Jesus to the disciples could go without an interruption. Look at verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So this, you know, John wants us to know this is not Judas Iscariot. He's already departed. So another name for this Judas is Thaddeus. And he asked this question because, again, he was thinking of a political Messiah. They all were. And he can't understand how Jesus could manifest himself to us later and not to the world and still be a political Messiah. That's what I believe he's, he's getting at. So they're expecting Jesus to take them out of Roman occupation, Roman bondage. And, he's, and they can't understand how that's possible. It's, not, it's, it's impossible to rule the world and not be seen. So he's coming from that perspective. They have no idea that he's going to not, he's not going to appear to the world and he's going to appear to them for 40 days after his resurrection. And then he's going to ascend. And they don't know that. They don't know that that's coming. He can't picture that. So Jesus responded, look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father's what my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Wow, really powerful. You can't you can't express any more intimacy than that. They could never have dreamed. You you realize that the even the Pharisees wouldn't call God Father. They could never dream that that closeness up to this point. This is Jesus, you know, showing the us and the world that. There's that God's a father and, and he loves his children. What father doesn't want to be close to his children? That's a healthy father anyway. So they couldn't even imagine that. And he says, we will come to him and make our home with him. What does the word home mean? The home That word home there is only used one other time in the Bible. And it's in the New Testament. It's actually in our chapter. Um, and I'll read to you where it is. In chapter 1 of chapter 14, we're told this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. That's the same word, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So the word mansion there is the same word as home in verse 23. This is unbelievable to think about this. When you really think about what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying he will go and prepare a place for them to abide. But long before that, he will make them into a home where he and the father can abide. Amazing. The saying this is true with us. He was going to make, he's making our life. He's made our lives as believers into a place where he can dwell. And again, no man would ever dream of this kind of intimacy. Why? Because we're, we know we're guilty <laughs> of sin, and we're never going to think that God would want to be that close to us. But you have to realize that Jesus has cleansed us. He's cleansed us from, and he's, and he's given us his Holy Spirit. And because we've trusted in Christ alone to pay our way to heaven, because of that, he, now we have a legal or positional position in Christ a positional holiness in Christ. And you see it in Ephesians where it says, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, we are in Christ. If we didn't have that designation by the Lord and he didn't do what he has done, we couldn't have anything to do with the holy God. He hasn't lowered his standards of holiness in the New Testament. He's still unapproachable. And he, that's why when Leviticus, that I mentioned earlier in my announcement, you know, you see just how narrow it, it, it's always been to approach God. You have to approach him how he says to approach him. He's going to establish the priesthood in Leviticus. Uh, and, and you would see how you have to come just exactly how he says to come to him. He says it exactly. So we have to obviously bow down and respect that. But he says, I'm going to, I'm going to prepare you as our place our place to dwell. And I just love that. And you know, it's not dependent on, um, you know, how we feel about it as believers. Sometimes we don't feel like any of this could be possible that, that God's living inside of us, but he doesn't leave it up to our feelings. Listen, feelings don't define truth. Feelings can be very unbiblical. So we have to bring our emotions and submit our emotions to 
God's word. Now look what he says in verse 24 as we close here. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So he says, it's very important to understand that if you're not obedient, he who does not love me does not keep my words. There's all kinds of people that say that they believe in Jesus. They'll wear a cross around their neck. They'll do all kinds of things. They'll talk about their relationship with God. A lot of people talk about their relationship with God now. It's actually very popular. But have they come God's way? Have they placed their faith in Jesus alone to pay their way to heaven? Have they repented? What is repentance? Repentance is changing your mind, making a U-turn in the road of life and turning to Jesus. Jesus didn't apologize for it. He said to people, follow me. He didn't beg them to follow him. He just said, follow me. And they had to make that choice if they were going to follow him or not. So if Jesus is big enough to be your Savior, He's big enough to be your Lord. And you have to understand God's heart. He just wants to spare us from pain and suffering. Um, Sin's not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. And it's destructive. It's destructive. And He knows that. And so we may not fully understand how this can be destructive, but it is destructive. And we have to submit our, our thoughts, our minds, our motives, all of that, to him so again our feelings are going to ebb and flow our feelings are going to be all over the place at times god's patient with that god's patient with our emotions he he works with with that he says i i want to be close to you regardless of what you feel i want to be close to you i want to make my home with you i want to i want to manifest myself to you that's a loving god that wants to be as close to us as he possibly can He says, so if you want to experience that, you have to love me. And to love me means showing it, action, whatever that means. And whatever he says in his word, whatever he speaks to our hearts, if we want to show him that we love him, we have to obey what he says because all his his commandments are good and they're righteous and they're holy and they're, they're perfect for us. So I would just encourage all of us, myself included, to focus on how patient he is, how gracious he is, how much he loves us, how much he wants to be close to us. We couldn't, we'd never even dream that he would want us to be that close to him, but he wants it. So, so that's why he says, I will come and, and, and I will come to him and make our home with him. We will be, we, he makes us a mansion for him to come and dwell. What a gracious God, what an amazing God, amen? Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, that you want to be that close to us. Thank you that you want us to be that intimate with you. We could never dream that. We know that's only possible through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So we, we want you, Lord, to help us to be the disciples you've called us to be. We thank you that you tell us that sin is destructive. So we want to be free from bondage. We want to be free from the destructive effects of sin. So I just pray that you give us a hunger for righteousness and a hunger for holiness, Lord, as we spend time with you each day and and allow you to impart your life to us and through us as we reach this lost world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.